Thank you for you, to you for surviving so late. I don't normally talk uh, economics with a PowerPoint presentation at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, Please keep approaching the end of the week as well, but let's see how we go. So I'm, I'm, ram I'm going over a few topics here today, and I want to start with one thing, which is, it's a bane for everybody in this room. I know we cop this all the time. How austerity works. I want to explain how it works, because we, I, I don't need to persuade you that it doesn't, but I want to give you a set of tools that I hope will give you a way of persuading other people that what they think works does work in precisely the opposite direction to what they think it actually does. So this is a simple little illustration. I, I hope even maybe even, even Theresa May might be able to understand. And so her favourite phrase, of course, we must live within our means. And it, it sounds sensible. This is one of the reasons that it's so hard to fight. These concepts sound quite seductive to people to say we must live within our means because that's what we all attempt to do in our little households, our little firms, our little financial corporations and so on. That's a major intent to try to save money. And if you imagine having a particular sector which is starts off in year zero and it's spending $200 a year, so $200 is going out and it's getting a $200 income in, then it's got zero savings. And so it should try the next year to spend less earn the same amount, or hopefully the other way around, well, let's say it goes that way, and it saves 10, 10, 10 pounds a year. That looks fantastic. So you start with zero savings, you spend 10 pound less, you put 10 away for a rainy day. And that's the philosophy that lies behind this idea of living within our means. Let's all try doing it. Let's see what happens. So sectors B and C were the ones that were paying the income to sector A there. And sector B, the sector A is spending $200 a year, I'll use dollars because I'm just used to my own currency. I'm sorry about those for those who are used to pounds. Um, so it's $200 a year going out, $100 being spent on sector B, $100 on sector C, and then the next year you reduce it by $10. What does that mean for sector B and sector C? It means their income is down by precisely the amount of money you've saved. Okay? Your $10 savings causes them to have $5 deficits each. Okay? So there's a direct link between the decision of one entity, I'm using sector in a very general sense, it could be individual people, it can be um, manufacturing, finance, services, uh, it can be the government, the rest of the economy. If you decide to save by spending less, by definition expenditure is income at the national level. At the individual you can have a gap between the two but you have an economic aggregate, expenditure is income, expenditure causes income. So if you try to save $10, you reduce the income of the people you are spending that money on by precisely $10. Okay. Now, it's not because they're irresponsible, it's because of their decisions about what to do, just to reduce the amount of spending they're doing. So the problem is that living with our means means, means spending less than you earn. And any individual can do that in a society. The society itself can't because there's an absolute identity between the two. What you spend becomes somebody else's income. That's the problem that we have to get people's minds past to see how can we actually make this work. So individual savings causes a fall in income. That's point one to start with. Now, what if we all try to save? Well, that's a reaction. When you suddenly find you're running a deficit, when you didn't intend running a deficit, one of the first things you do is, well, I might cut my spending back as well. That's the response. This is what Keynes was talking about as well, the way this is a spiral to the bottom. So we started with a total GDP here of $600. I've got pounds there, £600 per year. So sector A is spending £200 on B and C. B is spending the same on the other two. You get £600 of expenditure, which is the negative diagonal there. And the off diagonal is the income, exactly equal to the same, zero savings. Sector A got us to this situation by deciding to save £10 a year. There's now a £10 savings by sector A and £10 deficit by B plus C. So what if B and C decide to join the same act and they decide to cut back to the same level of spending, they all decide to save $10 each. Well, they achieve it. The aggregate savings is zero. It will always be zero. Okay. Income has fallen by 30. You've reduced the income of the economy. By trying to save 30 pounds, you've reduced GDP by precisely 30 pounds. So you can't save a surplus. But the thing is, people do try to save. This is one of my favourite statements from Marx. Accumulate, accumulate. That is Moses and the prophets. And that's true. 
everybody in society has a desire to accumulate. It's a generalisation, but it's not a bad generalisation. We get some people trying to give their money away. But generally speaking, people are trying to accumulate. Now, you can't. Whole economies can't save. So how do we solve the problem? How do we make it possible? Is it possible to make it possible that we can all save? Well, it is if we can find some mystery sector that spends more than it earns and continues doing that. So I'm going to bring in an extra sector. I'm going sector question mark. And I've set it up so sector question mark is earning or gaining $20 or £20 pounds of income from each of A, B and C and spending um, 30 on each of those sectors. And therefore those sectors A, B and C can now save $10, pounds, drachma, whatever, a year. They can do it. So what can sector question mark be? Because what it's doing is spending more than it earns so that each of sectors A, B and C can save that 10 and spend less than they earn. Can it be a bank? Well, it can, because if a bank, you borrow money from a bank, it gives you the extra money, you can spend more than you earn. The trouble is, it matches that with another little entry, which is a de debt you owe to the bank. So the increase in money you've got to spend is precisely equal to the debt you've accumulated. So your net gain is zero. You can certainly spend that money, that's where you get bubbles coming from, what if the government spends more than it gets back in taxation? Okay. That increases your deposit account by the, ten, by the extra 10, but you don't have a debt to the government when the government spends money on you. That's the difference with borrowing from a bank. What you get from the bank is identical to what they um, charge you as a debt. You've got a, a liability equal to the asset you've got from them by borrowing the money. But if the government spends money on you as a welfare recipient or somebody who's sold a service to the government and so on, that doesn't come with a matching debt. So you're free. In that sense, you can accumulate. You can save money that way. But the big problem, people say, is how does the government pay for it? Where does it get the money? It gets from its own bank. And this is the unique thing about a government in a real economy, which, of course, rules out any economy in the European Union, but it certainly includes the UK, the government owns its own bank. Now, legal rules stop the government doing what I'm going to show now uh, directly in a tabular sense, but what I'm showing here is a boiled down version of what happens if the central bank performs open, mar open market operations, buying bonds off people or institutions, <coughs> normally financial institutions, that have bought bonds off the Treasury. So I'm simply short-circuiting it. What happens when it find, finally those bonds are bought by the central bank, as we know the central banks have been doing on an enormous scale under QE for the last 10 years? Well, what you can show here, and I'm now using the, the notation I use in my Minsky software, that I show assets as a positive sum and liabilities and equities a negative sum. So you add the rows across, you necessarily get a sum total of zero. It's slightly reversed what I showed you the income and expenditure table beforehand. But I've shown the government wanting to spend 30 pounds additional to what it's getting back in taxation and it's got to pay let's say 10 percent interest on that to the central bank so it actually issues bonds worth 33 pounds and the treasury the central bank says we'll buy those thanks and so those become assets of the central bank the bonds the treasury then gets 33 pounds in its account which it can then spend and spends 30 pounds of that on the public so the reserves of the private banks rise because that's how the Treasury does its spending and it then pays three pounds across to the central bank. So that interest payments by the Treasury increase the equity of the central bank, which is something I wasn't aware of until I played this little game with this table. And then down at the private banks, the private banks then have that extra 10 per sector A, B and C turning up as deposits. So that rises by 30. The reserves rise by 30. That's all there is to it. So what you have is a dilemma in capitalism, which is a fundamental dilemma, and I'm going to elaborate slightly on this. If we all have a desire to accumulate, that's impossible collectively, unless some entity generates that equity for us, which the government can do. Now, it's got a double dilemma to it, because if you think about what banks are, private banks or institutions that start with a certain amount of equity and lever that up to be able to create assets, which are loans that they can charge interest on us. It's the leverage between their equity and their assets that let them operate and make the profits they do. But banks have to have positive equity. If their equity goes negative, they go bankrupt. 
Now, if you think about a perfectly, a completely private financial, a, a, pri a private capitalist economy, no government, leave the government out for this moment, because assets minus liabilities equals equity for everybody in society, including banks, if banks have to maintain positive equity, that means the sum total of the equity of the rest of society, the non-bank uh, sector, the households and uh, corporations fundamentally, their sum equity is negative. And yet they're trying to achieve positive equity. We have a fundamental dilemma in the finances of capitalism. A way to solve it is the government being able to create negative equity for itself, which it can finance through its own bank, enabling positive equity to be maintained by everybody else. So the government is actually solving a fundamental dilemma of capitalism by existing and by running what they call a deficit. But that deficit is it running a negative equity for itself, which lets, it lets us achieve positive equity. If we can get that through people's heads, we might be able to get rid of the obsession with austerity and living with our means. Now, if the government does the opposite, and this is what's going on right now, what they're trying to do, if they decide instead to run a surplus, which is the objective, of course, Osborne was working towards. I'm glad he's running a newspaper these days. Um, and what, in some ways, the Labor Party itself was sold on before Corbyn came along. If the government does actually try to run a surplus itself, it gives us a bigger deficit. This is the point the modern monetary theory crowd have been trying to make for some time. I agree with them on this particular point. So I want to show another way of arguing it. If the government runs a surplus, it puts us in a deficit, which is what we're trying to avoid. So it's a suicidal policy. And I hope that's simple enough for you to explain to your friends and start getting us through and getting us away from this problem of the government believing it should save. We, ca no, we can't all save in a, in a monetary economy. It's impossible. But one group can go into deficit, letting the rest of us save if we wish to, which is the function a government should have. So that's trying to get rid of some unrealistic economic, economics. I want to bring some realistic economics in now, because one thing I can claim is to have predicted the crisis before it happened, but the first time I did that was back in 1992, before the Great Moderation had happened. And I wrote a paper, wrote a, I built a model of a, um, a financial system attempting to model Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And it had a remarkable impact that I did not at all expect. This is what's called an emergent property in complex systems, that there was a period of tranquility before the crisis. So I finished off with what I thought was a nice rhetorical flourish at the end of my paper. And I didn't think it was going to become reality. But when I first showed this to one of my good friends in the econometric profession, uh, when I was doing my, my at the time I finishing my master's degree, Eric Sowey, he saw this particular phenomenon and his comment was, Steve, if you've identified anything that exists in capitalism, that really exists, we're in deep, deep trouble. That was in 1992. Well, he's right. What you can see going on there is what looks like a period of stability leading up to the chaos at the other end. And that's what actually happened. Moderation preceded the crisis. And this was, again, a set of phenomena that turned up from a model that I did not expect these results to come out of. I was simply trying to generate a model that could have a debt deflation. The fact that it gave me rising inequality and a moderation before the crisis was an emergent phenomena of the model. Now, was that a particularly deep insight? Well, I thought it was at the time, but I've realised since that I can drive this model by simply taking three macroeconomic definitions and putting them in dynamic form. So if I define the employment rate, how many people have a job divided by the population, the wages share of GDP, what wages are divided by GDP, and the debt to GDP ratio, and the definitions are obvious. If I define those and then put them in dynamic form by differentiating them with respect to time, I get three statements that are categorically true. This is not a model. This is a statement of fact, but put in in dynamic terms rather than aesthetic definitions. The employment rate in percentage terms will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of growth and labour productivity and population growth. That's a fact. The wages share of output will rise if wage demands exceed the growth and labour productivity. The second fact. And the third one, which is pretty obvious, the private debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Now, you put those three facts together and put them into a model. The way you put them into a model is to take some sort of relationship between those various entities. So I've taken an incredibly simple set of relationships. I have investment motivated by the rate of profit, 
which I think is a reasonable assumption. Wage demands are motivated by the level of employment. Debt incurred when investment desired investment exceeds retained earnings. So I don't have any Ponzi investing going on here. This is entirely productive investment. Put those three assumptions together and I get a model where you get workers end up paying for the increase in the debt level. They're not bringing any borrowing, borrowing the model at all, but they're the ones who pay for it through a declining wages share of GDP. And that was quite a remarkable outcome. So I might have to ask the person in the back room to press a button here to get this to run. Now, hang on, what am I doing? I've got my own bloody screen in front of me. Pardon me. I installed this as a... When I was worrying with sitting next to you, I was doing a little movie videotaping my screen. So this is the model with... Um, actually, I might as well run... Let's run the actual proper model here. I think I've got the software running in the background here. OK. So this is Minsky, my software package, Minsky. And what I've got here is an extremely simple um, flowchart model. I'll see if I can make that a bit larger so I can talk to it more accurately. So let's just uh, drag this over here a bit. It's exactly the same model, the same definitional model, but now shown as a system dynamics model. So have the amount of capital stock determining output, which determines employment, which determines an employment rate, which gives you the rate of change of wages, which gives you the wage bill, which you subtract from output to give you profit, if profit exceeds, if investment desires, given the rate of profit, exceed um, the retained earnings, then you borrow money, you pay interest on that money, you then have depreciation, reducing the existing capital stock, then have net capital being created, and back around you go. It's exactly the same model that's taken from definitions, but shown in a system dynamics guy, guys. And what I can do with Minsky, and I'll just see if I can drag that back again. So that's the model that's actually causing these results. The determinant variable there is how willing capitalists are to invest. So if I start with capitalists having a low desire to invest and simulate the model, and this is a beta version of the software, by the way, it takes a long time to react, which is, gets, gets annoying when I'm trying to give a demo, but there's lots of error checking going in the background. What you get is a system that cycles to equilibrium. So this is a classical complex systems model which has a bifurcation at a certain value of the desire to invest. And what you get is a nice convergence to equilibrium, which is it's more dynamic than the neoclassicals think about, but it's what they think happens in capitalism. Well, if I now increase the desire to invest and run the same model again, it looks like you're converging. But then you don't. There's a period of more rapid convergence. That's the great moderation effect leading to a breakdown. I'll explain the dynamics behind this, which is actually all to do with the distribution of income in uh, my new book. But you'll see the wages share of GDP is declining in that model. If I show you the profit share, and let's see if I've got that uh, shown elsewhere on the, on the slide here. I've rather mucked up this demonstration here, I'm afraid to say. But if you take a look at, let's see if I make that larger. Let's uh, expand, okay, and make that larger again. Oh, great. Again, this is some of the software not working all that brilliantly. Oh, boy. Russell's going to love that one. OK. Pardon me. I'll let that go in the background. Um, I shouldn't be trying to demonstrate by beta software while I'm running a software program. But what you have is the capitalist share fluctuates near the equilibrium, not around it, but near. The banker's share rises and the worker's share falls. The capitalists are the ones who are doing the borrowing the money, but the, the, the dynamics of the distribution of income means that the workers are the ones who cop it. And interestingly enough, a guy who got that right was one Karl Marx. I'll try to get back to where my uh, slideshow is running here and explain that. So what you get is the rising debt ratio causes rising inequality. The profit share stabilises. It runs around the equilibrium until there's a breakdown. The banker's share rises, the social group that pays for it are workers who get a lower amount of money. And that's what happened in capitalism. In a stylized way, that's what we actually experienced from 1990 to 2010. So what's the logic behind it? It's, it's, it's simple once you look at the overall dynamics. Capitalism is a profit-driven system. So how much investment occurs depends upon the rate of profit. And profit is net of what you pay in wages and interest. Investment will, when it takes off, will lead to a rising level of debt to finance that investment. 
The boom will cause a rising amount of money going to bankers and workers as well when the un unemployment rate drops sufficiently, which reduces the rate of profit. That falling rate of profit means that is a falling investment and therefore the economy goes into a slump. The slump will end when wages and debt payments fall sufficiently to restore the original profit share, but there will be a res residue of debt left if there's that more aggressive desire to invest. Capitalists won't quite pay off all the debt they accumulated during the boom once the slump occurs because their returns are lower. Therefore, the next boom will start with a residue of debt and therefore a larger share of GDP going to bankers and a small share going to workers. And that process works through a number of cycles until you have the sort of breakdown that we saw in 2007. So that's a cyclical process. And interestingly enough, Marx, who gave the foundation model for this back in 1867, got it right mathematically. He said this in the, this is in chapter 25 of Volume 1 of Capital. He said, to put it mathematically, the rate of accumulation is the independent variable. The rate of wages is the dependent variable. Precisely correct. So rising debt causes rising inequality. And what you've got with rising debt is a rising rentier claim on capitalism. And so I'm a critic of the rentiers. I'm not a critic of capitalism itself. But the bank the system we have with debt-based money makes bankers the first claimants on income in the system. And the final residual claimants are the claimants of the workers. So they're the ones who get screwed even if they're not doing any of the borrowing at all. They're the ones who end up paying for the increased level of debt. And what we have now, over the last uh, 30 years, is we've accumulated the highest level of private debt in the history of capitalism. These are two, the, the red line chart has been put together by the Bank of England after the crisis. The blue line of, of combining a number of, of series which I had to do a bit of rescaling with the Bank of England data uh, is pretty reliable all the way back to 1880. And you can see that the level of debt we have both in America and the UK right now is higher than it's ever been, including at the worst period during the Great Depression in, the, in uh, 1930 in America when deflation was the actual cause for that ratio rising. Now, what that's given us is anarchy, and thank you, it's not the Sex Pistols who gave us anarchy, it's Maggie Thatcher. Because that's just taking a longer look here. There was no trend in the level of private debt from 1880 to 1980, which was, I was not expecting to see that in the data. That was a surprise. Again, that's the Bank of England data. Then Maggie Thatcher gets in power. The real uh, factor I think people have explained to me in terms of institutional changes that occurred under her control uh, was the ab abolishing, let, letting banks get involved in lending for housing. I've forgotten what the act was, particular act was called, but in 1982, you might, might know Henry. Okay. But there's a particular deregulation at that stage. The banks could lend for housing, and I think that's what gave us the beginning of the bubble, plus, of course, the whole, the big bang, the whole deregulation of finance. And look at the change. We went from a debt level of 55% of GDP up to 120% under her, a bit of a slump, which is what let uh, Blair take over, and Blair did the same thing. And then we peaked at the level of debt of about 190% of GDP. It's since fallen to 160. It's now rising again. Let's look at the economics of that. Because a fundamental argument I make, and it's taken me a long time to work out the logic properly and to start persuading my fellow post-Keynesians on this, credit is part of aggregate demand. Expenditure is based on the, based on the turnover of existing money plus credit. And that then becomes income as well as capital gains for other people. So I do the correlation here. You look at the credit level, which is the, the red line graphed on the right-hand side. If you go back to the uh, 1950s, it was between minus three. Actually, it was negative a few times for, for the UK. But generally between, certainly below 10% of GDP every year. And there's no correlation. In fact, the correlation here is the wrong sign, inverted commas, the wrong sign I'm arguing credit drives unemployment. Because the debt level was so low back then and there was no trend, there was actually a positive correlation, not a causation at all, just that other factors dominated over the role of credit. Once we got past the stage of that deregulation, you can start seeing how strong the correlation is. I've turned the unemployment rate upside down, by the way. It's zero here and 12 here to show you the strength of the correlation once we get this totally financialised economy. And a reason, one reason why the employment rate is recovering right now is credit is growing once more in the UK. House prices all the way through. That's looking at the 
again, I've done the, this is the mathematical argument of be publishing with Paul Omer and when I finally pull my finger out and do the historical part of getting our literature survey done. Uh, we've done Granger causality on this United States. Much to my amazement, Granger causality confirmed their argument because Granger causality is a very linear approach and this is very non-linear dynamics. But fundamentally, change in mortgage, change in new mortgages causes change in house prices. So it's actually caused the level of house prices is the amount of money we let people borrow to buy them. We have to control that to get away from the financial crisis we're in. And uh, um, one of a bit of fun uh, recently writing a few satires by sheer accident. Having spent 40 years reading nonsense by neoclassical economists, I found occasionally on travel, I think, this is so crazy, uh, I start writing a, a comic book and I found a brilliant illustrator, a brilliant cartoonist called Miguel Guerra. We're working together and that book will be coming out shortly. Econ Comics, taking the con out of economics. And as we all know, there's a hell of a lot of con in there. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'll just um, save my recording here.